morning, my words of Focus Communications, and today we're getting an update from Versus, which trades on the Canadian NEO exchange under the symbol VERS. And joining me today is Versus CEO and founder, Gabe Rene. Gabe, thank you so much for coming back on the show. How are you? I'm doing good. It's great to be here, Megan. Thanks for having me. So for those new to Versus, could you give us a brief overview of the company? Sure. Versus is a uh, next generation uh, AI company focused on a category of technology called contextual computing, essentially the ability to enable various cameras and sensors and IoT devices and artificial intelligence to understand the context under which they're operating. And then we're building out a platform called Cosm, which is kind of like a next generation AI operating system to allow for these types of context or applications to be built. And we started by building our own applications with a very specific focus on using artificial intelligence to dynamically route warehouse workers faster through the warehouses across the supply chain. Um, so that's that's really a bit of context about what we're what we're what we're building, where we're going, and, and where we've gotten some traction. So last month you gave us an introduction to Versus Smart Logistics Solution Wayfinder and how it can help with the future and ongoing supply chain disruptions. Now, since our interview, you've had an announcement where you partnered with Tompkins Logistics, a leader in the supply chain sector. For those new to Jim Tompkins and Tompkins Ventures, could you run us through this release and partnership for the company? Yeah, absolutely. Well, Jim Tompkins is a legend in the uh, global supply chain and logistics space. He's been been a, a leader there for for nearly fifty years. Uh, Jim's been at the 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 sort of tip of the spear of many of the different upgrades that large organizations and corporations around the world have had to go through in the process of digital transformation within the supply chain, <clears throat> whether that's for robotics or warehouse management system optimization, um, you know, racking systems and in, in intelligent uh, conveyance systems, like you kind of imagine the Amazons of the world to have, uh, you know, Jim's been at the heart of, of a lot of those transformations. And of course, Jim's built a really strong network of uh, leaders from some of the largest uh, logistics and supply chain organizations that are part of Tompkins Ventures and Network, you know, senior executives from the largest warehouse management and fleet management and port management systems around the world. So the reason that we wanted to um, build this relationship with uh, Jim and, and his team is that we've gotten tons of demand from large Fortune 500s over the last 18 uh, to 24 months, interested in our Wayfinder application and some of the other logistics, smart logistics uh, solutions we've been developing, like how to figure out how to use AI to do capacity management and where to slot the products when they come in. So not just moving on the floor, but literally moving everything in the facility. <clears throat> this applies obviously not just to the insides of warehouses, but to manufacturing environments and ports and retail. So being able to uh, uh, make sure that we're partnering with the right customers at the right time in the right order, especially when you're a small company is really key. So we wanted to have that kind of competency and guidance that we get from someone like uh, Jim and his uh, his his network, um, not just to sort of be biz dev leads uh, for us, but uh, also to be able to help us get the aim part of the ready aim fire portion of, of the business right. And it seems like the opportunities presented through this partnership could be endless. So how do you intend to handle the potential growth? Well, one of the ways that we're looking at handling growth is through our platform. So Cosm itself is designed to be a self-service platform, much more like iOS or Android is today, where Apple doesn't develop all of the applications on their platform. They essentially enable tooling for developers to be able to develop their own applications. Uh, Salesforce does this. Uh, Shopify does this. So enabling self-service really allows scale. So when you've got this kind of demand, the, the ones that you pick early, especially if you wanted to use it as showcases to the market to show both the art of the possible and, and to demonstrate real revenue, um, that's important to get those right. Ultimately, the scale comes from the capabilities of the, the platform itself. Absolutely. Now, fast forward to last week where you've announced and closed a $10 million private placement and also announced that the company had joined the Digital Twin Consortium, uh, starting with the private placement. Uh, congratulations, by the way, on closing so quickly. And for our listeners, could you discuss use of funds from this raise? Yeah, you can kind of see the, 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 the problem that we have as a, as a scale-up company is, is um, 
kind of the opposite of most. So most of the time you've built a product out and you're trying to, to build a business pipeline. Uh, we have a really big business pipeline and we're trying to build the product uh, up to the point where we can let that business pipeline start to self-serve. So the point of, of the use of funds is really more developers, more engineers, uh, and more operations people. When you have these kind of self-serve platforms, this is like akin to say Microsoft Azure or SAP or Oracle or Salesforce or ServiceNow, you know, the, the large uh, software as a service platforms have these sort of self-service portals. It's not just the underlying technology you have to develop. You have to develop all the all the tooling and the interfacing, the, the videos, the instructional stuff, the forums, the webinars, right? So there's at one level, you need your, your development team to continue to make make progress on maturing the product. On the other side, you need your sort of dev ops and your operations teams to build out all this service stuff because your customer service facing component now is a direct interface through these sort of web portals and platforms that are that are these developers are using to access the technology. So in that respect, that's really where the capital is going. It's it's just more competent people with more experience in that area. You're you're gonna see some announcements around some new hires that have some exceptional expertise that come from some of these large companies that have successfully built these kind of large cloud infrastructure enterprise platforms in the past um, coming into coming into the fold. So those those, uh, those press releases will be coming out uh, very shortly, but that's essentially the use of proceeds. Now, I found the Digital Twin Consortium news pretty interesting as it's a space mm -hmm. that's someone new to me. Could you run us through what, <laughs> what a Digital Twin is and yeah. the benefits? being a member of the Digital Twin Consortium, as it looks like some fairly significant companies are already a member. Yeah, so the Digital Twin, if you've not heard the term before, is the most, uh, it's probably the most interesting modern idea that that uh, that folks aren't familiar with that will become very obvious in the future. It's okay. probably similar to like the, the word website in 1993 or 1994. Right, <laughs> okay. What is a website? Um, yeah. A Digital Twin is, uh, a mostly a, a three-dimensional representation of, of a real-world object um, or a system or a process. So it could be it could be a, a rep a replication of uh, of of, a, of an airplane or just the motor of an airplane, um, or it can be an entire manufacturing plant. The the difference is it's not just a three D model. It's using uh, sensors on those devices to update the digital twin, the model in real time. So you want to say, well, how hot is the engine? Now you think about when you're driving your car today, uh, your dashboard acts as a kind of digital twin in the sense that there's things monitoring the activity, how much gas do you have, um, you know, how fast you're going, um, you know, whether or not your radiator is is it needs more water or that the engine's at a certain temperature. So you just have a couple of dials and knobs. But imagine if it was a full three dimensional model representation of the car where that data was was viewable. And imagine that not only you could see it from inside the car, but you, others could access that information and see it. So imagine if mm -hmm. like as a manufacturer, um, uh, let's say I'm, I'm Frigidaire, I make refrigerators. Wouldn't it be nice to know um, that refrigerators in a certain region are all failing the same way at the same time? And that might have to do with say the, the, the temperatures uh, in, that, in that part of the world are impacting how people, how people, how much, colder everyone is turning up their refrigerator um right. in a manufacturing plant you may want to know wh when things are going to fail where issues are starting to occur that are creating errors that are causing recalls you know years down the line um in the medical field uh you know you can see that even things like a fitbit are starting to track different parts of your your sleep or your heart rate or whatever so this three-dimensional uh, representations tied to real-time data sets is essentially what a digital twin is um, the Digital Twin Consortium now is a group of uh, 100 plus members of most of the largest companies around the world, uh, aeronautics, uh, manufacturing, um, logistics, large tech companies, you know, Google, Microsoft, Boeing, Esri, the largest geospatial map provider in the world. Think of this as Google Maps for businesses and governments and militaries, you build out all the various layers. Um, you can even think of Google Maps or Google Earth as a type of digital twin for the planet, mm -hmm. right? It's when you look at your Google Map, you're seeing real-time traffic data. That's kind of a digital twin. What are the advantages of this? Well, you you now have a model that is physically coherent in its representation of the real-world thing, which can which is increasingly important um, if you're trying to figure out how how whether a thing is going to fit inside your your warehouse or your port or your retail location 
the, the spatial dimensions become important. If you want to use artificial intelligence to predict where objects should go or shouldn't go or the routes, fastest routes between things, you need a digital twin to do that. We use a digital twin in Cosm in our Wayfinder app to have a, a three-dimensional model of the warehouse. All of the boxes and inventory are mapped into those locations, and that's what's routing that worker through the space. So what's powerful about this consortium is you have now really the largest participants in the world from every major industry, governments, uh, universities, et cetera, trying to come up with standardized approaches to these digital twins so that they can be interoperable, so that when things become parts of other things, that, that those data sets are, are clear, the spatial dimensions and information around that are clear, clear and usable by all parties. And that's why I kind of jokingly say it's much like a website. Mm -hmm. You know, there were digital... Uh, document editors, the Word and others before that. Um, and you and I could send each other PDFs and things like that before the World Wide Web, but we didn't have one page that we could all go to, like more like a Google Doc, edit that page, see updates on that page, and really have one consistent uh, standardized approach to that. And instead, we'd send each other a Word document that might get completely out of sync with each other, right? You yeah. make an edit, I make an edit. What version was it? One or one, one dot yeah. one and one dot two, right? It was yeah. everyone crazy. Now imagine that applied to the physical world and as messy as that is. So everyone wants to standardize these capabilities. Um, the work that Versus is doing, especially with the standards development around spatial computing and context-aware applications that we were developing with standards bodies like the IEEE, means that what we can bring to this network is some of the core standards that will enable some of the largest corporations in the world to build interoperable digital twins. We're also bringing COSM to the table, which means that there'll be a platform for people to integrate these different data sets, figure out what kinds of workflows and management they want for human activities that are digitally mediated through a smartphone or through a headset, drones, autonomous vehicles, robots, et cetera, whether those are in manufacturing plants, whether those are in our homes or our streets uh, or our schools uh, or our cities at large, everyone's going to need both the interoperability and the management capabilities. And that's what comes with Cosm by default. And so that's one of the reasons that you see that the, um, you know, the CTO of the, the consortium is so excited to have us join. And obviously this, this gives us a forum with which to work directly with some of the largest organizations in the world around standardizing these capabilities and then begin to let them to use, use Cosm to actually build out the applications they want that will then be interoperable. Well, it's crazy. <laughs> so much information. It was so awesome, though. Blows my mind. That's 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 the exciting thing about it is <clears throat> these are not just um, theoretical, and the demands are not theoretical. Everyone has a demand today that they would like these solutions to work for. Everyone's worried about investing in custom solutions. They're going to have to rewind. So they want to be in these types of groups and kind of come to agreements and consensus. It's like, IEEE standardized, you know, Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. Well, every manufacturer that builds a radio for one of those needs to know that it's going to work everywhere. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's what that's what these types of groups really do is that everyone comes together and there's very much a rising tide raises all ships sort of approach. You get an amazing sort of global collaboration at scale. And we think we have something very unique to offer that group. 